morning, church. Hey, we're so glad that you are joining us today. We'd love for you to stand and sing and worship with us.
have your seats for a few moments. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Believer's Church. I'm Rochelle, the outreach director here. And you know, I think it's really cool that each and every one of you has chosen to be a part of this worship experience today where we can meet our Savior and really just get encouraged and lifted up to keep on working through this thing called life. And a great way to be able to fully engage in this experience is by going ahead and scanning the QR codes that you guys will find on the back of the seats today. That'll take you to our hub where you're able to access our app and the communication card as well as our giving platforms. And we'd love for everybody to fill out the communication card. That's a place where you can let us know what's happening up in your world this week and how we can be joining you in prayer over everything that God is doing in your life and and everything that you are growing through. Also, if this is your very first time with us, a special welcome to you. We're really glad that you are choosing to be here today, whether you're joining online or you're here in person. We would love for you guys to indicate that on the communication card. And when you do that, we just want to give you some free stuff. We're not going to uh, 
put you on a list and send you tons of messages. We just want to give you some gifts and say thanks for being here. And if it's your first time with us today and you're on campus, we'd love for you to swing by Guest Central on your way out. And there you're going to get a gift bag that will include a free Chick-fil-A sandwich. Yummy, yummy. I hear that's a happening spot. So I hope you guys will take advantage of that opportunity. So uh, we know that some of you guys are having your very first time here, and we are praying that you feel loved and connected and welcomed. And we want that experience for everyone in our community who wants to be connected, to be here and a part of a faith family that just wants to love on them. So you guys, what if we were able to double ourselves and welcome twice as many of us in one day? We're gonna attempt that on big day. So we have a really big day happening on Sunday, October 2nd. And on this day, we would love for you to invite friends, family, folks that you know are needing a place to get connected. And today we're going to be equipping you with some invites on your way out. You can grab an invite for big day that is going to have a packet of hot apple cider because you guys, fall is just around the corner and we are looking forward to just uh, welcoming people in with the same warmth of the season. So make sure that you guys are grabbing that and participating and sharing love in that way on your way out today. We also have baptisms coming up. So baptisms is a great way to express your choice to follow Jesus. And if you are ready to take that step in your faith journey, you can do that happening on September 25th. Go ahead over to the Believers Church app or website and you can sign up for that. And let us know that you are going to allow us to walk with you in that celebration in your faith journey. Um, another amazing opportunity that's happening here, y'all, we are kicking off B groups next month. I know, B groups are amazing. This is where we're meeting together um, in smaller groups and we are really able to do life with each other here at Believers. So when you sign up for your B groups, if you need any assistance, have questions about how to do that, um, you can swing by the B groups uh, kiosk on your way out today and just chat with those folks or find anybody who might be wearing a button that says, ask me about B groups. Those folks will be able to give you some uh, direction too on how to get yourself connected with a group this next season and we're going to be doing a fantastic series together. We'll all be doing a, a study together and talking about just a beautiful story of the love of the church, the first church in our love for Jesus. So I hope you guys will check that out. Um, so we're going to uh, head into another time of singing in just a moment. But, you know, I yesterday I had a really bad day, y'all. Like, <laughs> A really bad day where I just kind of crumbled everything kind of crumbled and I just didn't want to do it how many of you have days like that sometimes okay so we we all have bad days right we all have bad days one of my favorite books as a kid was Alexander and the terrible horrible no good very bad day well that was yesterday for me and honestly I woke up this morning and I was like nope I don't want to do this day either because yesterday was that awful and I just I was in my quiet time and I was chatting with a friend who's been encouraging me. And Jesus brought this verse to me. It's from King David. And y'all, this man, whew, he went through a lot. The more I learn about David, I am just so uh, captivated by his story and the things that he wrote. But he wrote this, he said, God, you are my God. This is Psalms 63, one through three. God, you are my God. I shall be watching for you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and exhausted land where there's no water. So have I seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and glory because your favor is better than life. My lips will praise you. And I don't know what you're going through. I know we have these really tough seasons where we're thirsty and we're exhausted and we're having horrible, terrible, no good, very bad days. And y'all, we're in this series right now called Money Talks. And sometimes our finances feel that way and we sit down and it's horrible and it's terrible. But we serve a God who wants to meet us right there he wants to walk us through how we get in a place where he gives us that living water and he quenches our thirst. And that's a God 
that I want to admire. I admire him for being that for us. And when we sing praises of admiration like hallelujah, I know we hear that word and sometimes we just sing it. We don't know what it means. Hallelujah is a praise of rejoicing. It's warm admiration. So we have this opportunity to sing together and say, I admire you for being here for me when I don't want to even show up for myself. Whether it's in my life, in my relationships, in my finances, that's who we serve you guys. Who's excited to worship a God like that today? Yeah? Let's stand and let's continue in a time of singing together.
came today. I can't wait to find out what we ordered. I'm sure you can't either. Look what I found. Remember this? A penny saved is a penny earned. Hello? Anybody in there? Hmm. Echoey. Just look at them all. We're rich. I don't like the word hoarder. I prefer the term saving visionary. 
Who needs a 401k when this buried treasure could be worth uh, something one day? And this, yes, this, worth every penny. Good morning, Believers Church. It is good to see you. My name is Jamie. I am one of the pastors here, and I am sporting my Night of Impact t-shirt. We had a fabulous evening Friday for all of our Impact team members. For those of you who missed it, I'm sorry that you missed it, but we really did have a great time. And uh, I'm the blue was for uh, adult ministries, and I'm really proud to say that we came in second place. So it was really fun. Anyway, um, we're in this series called Money Talks, and it's a series that we've leveraged from our good friends and partners at North Point Ministries. And what we're doing in this series is just kind of looking at this idea of what would our money say if our money could talk? Like if our money was for us, trying to help us, help us win with money, what would it tell us? And what we've been learning is that what our money would say if it could talk sounds an awful lot like what Jesus did say when he did talk. And um, Jesus talked a lot about money. He talked about more about money than he did even heaven. And I think there's a, a reason for that because Jesus wasn't just a, a spiritual mystic talking about philosophical ideas out there. He was a, he was a very practical teacher and uh, he knew that um, he, he wanted to connect the, the spiritual ideas that he was sp speaking of, and he wanted to connect them to the physical realities of this world. And so, um, you know, he knew that the reason he talked more about money than heaven is because we worry more about money than heaven. Isn't that true? Uh, we, we looked at in a series, a couple series ago, I think it was, um, this idea that even people who don't believe in God believe that there is a heaven waiting for them. So we have, we have plenty of faith to believe in heaven, even if you don't have enough faith to believe in God. But man, we struggle to have enough faith to believe that we'll have enough to make it through the next week or the next month or the next you know two years or whatever it is or make it through this particular problem. And Jesus knew that it would be very easy to say, you know, I love God, I trust God, um, that's easy because God's invisible. And so Jesus links brilliantly, I think, the spiritual and the, and the physical, and he, he puts faith into terms that can actually be quantified, something that's almost impossible to quantify. Jesus did it in a way that it was, it was measurable. So uh, one day someone asked Jesus, what's the most important commandment, um, you know, in all of the the, the Bible, the Old Testament, and Jesus responded by saying, well, the most important commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then Jesus knew it'd be super easy to say, oh, I love God. And so Jesus adds another command. It's the same command. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And now, brilliantly, Love of God has been quantified by how we love others. So the way you love the person you love the least is how you love God the most. That's what Jesus said. The, the way you treat the person that you disagree with is actually how you love God. That stings just a little bit, doesn't it? And Jesus does the same thing with money and resources. He says, wherever your treasure is, there your, the desires of your heart are will also be. And he ties your heart and your devotion to God with your resources. It's brilliant, really. First week, we, we talked about what our money would say if it could speak to us, and our money would say, I can add meaning to your life, but I'm certainly not the meaning of life. Money becomes most meaningful when you view it as a means to an end that is not you. And that's also true for your life. Your life takes on meaning and significance when you live your life for something that is bigger than you. People who only live for themselves, well, in the end, will most likely end up by themselves. And if money is an ends for you, then in the end, uh, you're likely to end up with some money and maybe a couple people fighting over it, but that's about it. In the very first week of the series, I told you to wrestle this question to the ground, and I hope that you have been, 
And the question is this, to what ends do you want your life to be a means? What are you going to live for? What's the purpose of your life? What drives you? And, and whatever you decide there, whatever that, that big thing is that you're going to live for, whatever you decide, uh, your money, your resources will also follow you. Then last week we said our money would tell us this, uh, I'm easier to keep up with than I am to catch up with. Isn't that true? If at the end of the week or a month or a pay cycle, you don't know where your money went or you don't know how you got into the debt that you're in, what that tells you is you have lost track of your money. And if you lose track of your money, it is very difficult to catch back up with. It's very hard to do. It requires an enormous amount of effort and intentionality to catch up with your money once you've fallen behind. And I know, um, you know, the, the economy is kind of turning south. It's in the process of making this pivot from the great days to uh, things are getting a little tougher out there. And uh, good days don't last forever. The economy always goes in cycles. And for some of us, this turning south of the economy is, is catching us in a bad spot. And if you've lost track of your money, that's especially true for you. And if that is true for you, I've got really good news for you. Uh, next week at 5 o'clock, we are hosting the Financial Learning Experience with Joe Sangle. And uh, if you've lost track of your money, uh, this evening of, of learning about your finances is going to give you hope. It's going to give you very practical application steps that you can take to more quickly catch up with your money. It will help you to do that. If you're already caught up with your money and, and you're, you know, you're feeling pretty good about where you're at, Joe will also be talking to us about how to win with your money. Uh, he will have investment strategies in an incredibly turbulent uh, stock market time, so your retirement accounts and all of that kind of stuff. He will give you um, uh, some tools, some tips on how you can win even more with your money. And uh, registration for this is required, but it's 100% free. So you can register for the financial learning experience using the QR code on the chair in front of you. Uh, you can go to our website, or if you have the Believer's Church app, you just go to the events tab, and you can register for that. And if you need child care for this event, we're providing it for free, but you must register today. So we, uh, we have to hire people to watch kids, and we need to know how many people to have here. So if you need child care for this event, Today's the cutoff for that. Um, and even if you don't need childcare, signing up today would be very helpful because it'll make sure that we have all the resources that we need to hand out for uh, that event. So please sign up for it. Share it with some of your coworkers and your friends. It's not a churchy event at all. It's a great event that will help your friends and neighbors win with their money as well. So last week we said, what you do with your money says a lot about who you are and whose you are. Like, if you use all of your money on you, then does, here's a good question, does God really have control of your life? And if you use all of your money the exact same way that someone who doesn't even follow Jesus uses their money, are you really following Jesus? I would encourage you to track your money for the next 60 days. That was the, the big Next step from last week's message, I had several conversations with people uh, who are doing that. I hope that you are. And today I'm going to give you another challenge. And today it might feel like I'm leaning on you a little bit, but I want to remind you it's not me. I'm just telling you what Jesus says about resources. And remember, Jesus doesn't want anything from you. He really doesn't. And he didn't just say he doesn't want anything from you. He proved it, right? Jesus is for you. He laid down his life for you to pay for your sins. So if anyone could say he doesn't want something from you, it would be Jesus. So are you ready? If your money can talk, here's what it would tell you. Your self-control determines which of us gets control. Your self-control will determine who or what has control in your life. Who gets control of you has far less to do with how much money you have coming in and far more to do with what you do with what you have. And the financial pressure 
that many of us experience, like if you feel tension in your financial lives, um, your financial pressures are determined by your level of self-control. That is a fact. The amount of financial pressure you feel is determined by your level of self-control. Think about this. Uh, Two-thirds of the world's prop- uh, population probably couldn't even relate to your idea of financial pressure. Like if you sat down with someone from uh, someone in a developing nation and you tried to explain to them the financial pressure that you are feeling trying to swing that $600 car payment, they wouldn't be able to relate to that. Or if you're talking to them about upgrading a perfectly fine house, they wouldn't be able to relate to that. Or the prime packages that you seem to be addicted to, uh, most of the world would not even be able to relate to that. We are very wealthy by the world's standards. If you told someone from the Central African Republic, and I chose that country because that is where my wife grew up, if you, if you were to tell someone from the Central African Republic how much money you make a year, and I don't even care who you are in here, if, if you said, no matter who you are, no matter how much you make, how much you make in a year, and you said, I'm feeling financial pressure, and this is how much I make, they would look at you with bewilderment. Because if they made as much as you make, they would never experience financial pressure again. It would be as if they won the lottery. They, they can't conceive of making that much money. All of their dreams would come true. And, and you know, we often say, man, if I only had a little more money, then everything would be better and the pressure would be off. But if your money could talk to you, it would say, if you only had more self-control. If you only had more self-control. See, it's your self-control that determines who or what has control in your life. And, and this is really where faith and finances intersect. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who committed his life to spreading the teachings of Jesus to the known world and, and going to either establishing communities of faith like Believer's Church or, or going to churches similar to ours and explaining the teachings of Jesus, he addressed this tension that we all feel between self-control and our stuff. And here's what he said to the church at Galatia. He said, I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And Paul is saying that the key, really, to following Jesus is to be in touch with the promptings of the Holy Spirit. These internal nudgings, it's the only way I can really explain it, uh, that, that nudges us towards God, towards um, following Jesus. And, and Paul says, if you follow these nudgings, these promptings of the Holy Spirit, um, it's going to create a little bit of a tension in you because the nudgings of the Holy Spirit are going to cause you to not do what your sinful nature is craving. So you have a nudge from the Holy Spirit, and that nudge is going to be in the opposite direction of what your sinful nature craves. And he's talking to followers of Jesus here. And he says, if you start following these nudgings of the Holy Spirit, these promptings of the Holy Spirit, and you do it long enough, what you're going to experience is dramatic life change. Your priorities are going to start to change. Your, your thoughts are going to start to change. And eventually, it's going to result in the Holy Spirit producing this kind of fruit or, or evidence in your lives, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, and there's our word, and self-control and self-control. That's a pretty good list, isn't it? Like, if you don't want that for yourselves, don't you at least want that for your spouse? Isn't that true? Like, you, you, you want that for your kids or your parents? I mean, that's a pretty good list. And the reason it's a good list is because it's a picture of Jesus. That's what it is. And so the Holy Spirit is nudging you to become more like Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And remember, Jesus is for you. So the Holy Spirit's not nudging you in the direction of Christ-likeness because he wants to rain on your parade. No, the Holy Spirit is nudging you in the direction of Jesus because um, Jesus knows what all of us know, and that is it is not good to be controlled by an appetite. 
right? It's not good to be controlled by our desires. That's not a good thing. Uh, no doubt you've experienced in your own life a, a season of your appetites being in control or you know someone, someone that you love, and their appetites are in control. And when someone is being controlled, being mastered by their appetites, man, it's not good. Uh, it can destroy things. It can wreck families. It can um, destroy relationships. It can cause you to lose your job or lose your self-respect. And besides, if you follow Jesus, uh, you can't be controlled by another master because you already have one. And I know we kind of push back on that, that term master. It's a, it's a loaded term in our culture, but it was a loaded term when Jesus used it too. And yet Jesus used it. And I think he maybe chose that word because it would at least get our attention. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Nobody. And, and many of us would probably say, well, I don't even serve one master. But that's not true if you follow Jesus. That, that word that's translated there as master is used a whole bunch in the New Testament. Most of the time, it's not translated as master. It's translated as Lord. You cannot have two lords. You cannot have two bosses. You cannot have two masters. Something has to be in control. You cannot be divided on this. And then Jesus continued and he said, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and... Now, if you had never read the Bible before, some of you have, and you know exactly what that next word is. But if you'd never read the Bible before, what might you put in there? You cannot serve both God and, I don't know, the devil. It seems like the opposite of God, right? You cannot serve both God and yourself. That would be a, a pretty good choice of words too. But Jesus, Jesus chooses something completely different. He says you cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and and money. And it was so smart of Jesus to say that. And Jesus is not angling for your money. Remember, Jesus is for you. He rightly understood that the chief competitor for your heart would be your pursuit of stuff, your pursuit of more, your pursuit for security in something or someone outside of Jesus. And it's pretty obvious what Jesus is saying here. He wants you. He wants your heart. Um, and Jesus knows that it would be easy for you to say, you know, well, I have Jesus in my heart. I've given Jesus my heart. But if you haven't surrendered your stuff to Jesus, have you really surrendered to Jesus? Like, if you haven't given Jesus access to what you have, have you really given Jesus access to you? That's really what he's getting at here. And if that is the case, Jesus says, you know, you've opted for a lesser master, a lesser Lord. And Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is the word priorities. You can't have two lords. You can't have two masters. One has to take the top spot. And Jesus knew that our stuff, our pursuits, our hearts would be divided. And so he says, choose which is going to have first place. And then he encourages us with these words. He says, seek first. Like you could be divided between your masters, but Jesus is encouraging you to make a choice, a choice that many of us have yet to make. And Jesus is spelling it out for us. He says, if you want to get this right, if you want me to be your Lord, if you don't want to be driven by your appetites, if you're terrible at self-control, this is the, the pathway out of that, of being driven by your appetites. Make a different choice. Choose something else to be first. And then he encourages us, and he tells us exactly what he wants us to choose. He says, seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, his righteousness. And that term righteousness, it sounds like a kind of a Bible-esque kind of word. Um, he's saying, choose my righteousness 
uh, make the pursuit of righteousness your number one objective. And the word righteous really isn't all that complicated. Jesus embodied righteousness. So he's saying, just pursue Jesus with everything that you have. Um, because if you're concerned about having enough or more or better in the driver's seat of your life, then that's what's going to drive your life. So seek me first, my others first, me second kingdom. Choose that. Make that your priority. I mean, after all, that's what Jesus did for us. He put us first. He courageously, boldly put you ahead of himself. Your need, your your. Um, your, your problems ahead of his own. And he died for your sins. And Jesus says, if you will do this, if you will choose me in my righteousness, in my kingdom first, then you'll have more purpose and more meaning and more joy in your life. Um, everything in our society speaks against this, though. Everything in our culture drives against this teaching of Jesus. Everything in our culture says the, the place you want to be is the top, right? Get to the top. No one wants to be stuck on the line forever. No one wants to be, you know, stuck in middle management forever. People want to get to the top. Why? Because, well, the top's where the action is. It's where the power is. It's where the, it's where the money is. And even the disciples knew this. So the disciples, they're with Jesus. They're listening to him teach. Jesus is saying that he's the son of God. He is the Messiah. And so they're convinced, like, the, the kingdom of Israel is about to be reestablished. Rome is about to be overthrown. And, man, they cannot believe their good fortune. They are with Jesus while this is all going down. And so as they're going to Jerusalem for what they think is going to be the coronation of the new king, they start arguing among themselves. And their argument is, who of us is going to be number two in the kingdom? And when Jesus overhears them on the road trip to Jerusalem, he pulls the car over. I don't know if you ever had a, a moment where your parents pulled the car over. Uh, it's never really good. And when I was a kid, if the school bus driver pulled the bus over, someone was about to get hurt, right? So Jesus pulls the car over and he says, wait a second, wait a second. You know how the kingdoms of this world work, right? Don't you? Like everything's a pyramid and the closer you get to the top, the more powerful you are. And the disciples are like, yeah, of course, of course we know that's how it works. That's why we're trying to get to the top spot with you. We, of course we know that. And then Jesus says to them, listen, guys, it doesn't work that way in my kingdom. It's not about being at the top. In fact, in my kingdom, the pyramid is just flipped upside down. And greatness is measured by how many you serve, not how many you control. You want to be great? Then you need to follow my lead, follow my example. And then he tells them this, and he's speaking of himself. He says, even the son of man, I came not to be served, but I came to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. And then they go to Jerusalem, and man, does Jesus ever put on a clinic for what it means to, to put others first. They go and they observe the Passover celebration, and Jesus pushes away from the table, and he washes the disciples' feet, which is like the it's a servant's job, but it's, it's worse than a servant's job. It's the servant who, who drew the short straw job, right? These filthy feet that are covered with dirt and dung, and Jesus washes their feet, and then he goes back to the table, and he says, listen, guys, you need to do exactly as I have done for you. Go and flip the script. Do as I have done. Put the kingdom first. Put yourself after that. But what about all the stuff I need, Jesus? What about rent? What about clothes for the kids? What about groceries? And Jesus says, listen, if you will put my kingdom first and, and my righteousness first, then all of those things are going to be given to you as well. See, it's not, a, it's not a question of either or. It's a question really of first and second. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Choose the other's first kingdom. Put something ahead of you, Jesus says. Put my kingdom ahead of you. And Jesus knew what it takes 
most of us, decades to figure out that when I put myself first, eventually I end up last. And the reason is because if I put myself first, it's hard to say no to me. Isn't that true? You're the hardest person to say no to. And if you're always putting yourself first, what's going to happen? Some of your appetites are going to rise to the top, and they will assume control, and they will drive your life. And no one wants to be driven by their appetites. And God the Father does not want you to be driven by your appetites either. And the solution is you put something else other than you in that top spot. If you get this out of order, your whole life becomes disordered. So what do we do? Well, Jesus already told us you have to put something else in front of ourselves. We have to make his kingdom our top priority, his righteousness our top priority. We have to flip the script when it comes to our resources because the script that we were born into and the script that you know, 99% of our country is following goes just like this. It's you, you live first, save second, give last. You, you live, you get paid, and um, you, know, you use all of the money that you have on you. You, you uh, take care of you, you upgrade, you pay something on the credit card. You don't even remember what you're paying for on the credit card, but you know you gotta pay something, so you throw a little bit of money at the credit card. Um, and then it's, you know, it's meals out, it's, it's Uber Eats in, it's, it's Netflix, it's Disney Plus, it's Hulu, it's Discovery Plus, Motor Trend Plus, all the other pluses. Um, and then if you have anything left from any of that, then you, you save and you save. It's never enough. You know it's not enough. Retirement's coming, but you save. So you save a little bit, um, but it's not enough. And if there's anything left over, anything at all, well, then you can give. And you can give to your church or you can give you know, to your favorite charity, $11 here, $11 there, you know, $10 a month to keep the dog out of the shelter, or whatever it is that you're giving your money to. That is me first living. And that is what 99% of our country is doing. And as we said, like this is average and average is not working. The average person is losing with their money. You know that's true. But if Jesus is who he claimed to be, if Jesus came and gave his life as a servant of all and then conquered the, the grave to prove to his critics that he was, in fact, God in the flesh, then the most thoughtful thing we could do is to lean in and adopt this others first, me second attitude that Jesus calls us to and flip the script and just turn it back on its head. And give first. The first moment that you get paid, you just, you give a percentage of it away. You, you invest it in his kingdom and then you save. You save for your own kingdom because we, we do have to survive and live here. We do need to prepare for the future. And most of us are not prioritizing that enough. And then with whatever's left, you live. Like it's completely opposite of what we've been told completely opposite. Now, if Jesus isn't your master, you can ignore me because this really doesn't apply to you. But what's kind of interesting is this, um, this way of living, of using your resources this way, has grown increasingly popular even in the non-Christian community. You can Google it. You can Google secular tithing and you will find gobs of articles about people who aren't even people of faith, but they have discovered that when you give, there's something freeing about it. It helps you to win with money. One example is from the book, The Automatic Millionaire, David Bach. It's a best-selling book, um, and he has a chapter in this book. It's not a Christian book. I don't even know if David Bach is a person of faith or not. Um, I don't get the impression that he is by reading the book, and I did read his book. Um, he has a chapter titled Automatic Tithing, and here's what he says. Tithing it's not about following tradition or trying to rid yourself of guilt or hoping for some future reward. What it's really about is giving for the sheer joy of giving. And then he continues. Here, here's something amazing. Abundance tends to flow back to those who give. The more you give, the more it comes back to you. It's the flow of abundance that brings us more joy, more love, more wealth, and more meaning in our lives. It's as if he's quoting Jesus. 
See, here's the thing about the teachings of Jesus, the principles of Jesus, they work even if you don't follow Jesus. So David Bach has discovered a financial principle, an ancient principle taught by Jesus himself, and it's worked for him, and it'll work for you too. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus, this isn't optional. You have to choose whose kingdom is going to come first, yours or his. And I know it's intimidating. It's so intimidating that I was in full-time ministry and resisted it. For the first 10 years of my marriage, I resisted this. Um, But then I discovered, or I buckled is how I like to say it, because I was losing with money, and I buckled to this financial principle of Jesus, and my life completely turned around. And when I talk about this, I get passionate about it because I know, I've seen it too many times, when someone gets this, their life changes for the better every single time. You know, we trust Jesus with our eternity and our problems and our worries. Why not our money? Why not our resources? So we want to come alongside of you for the next 90 days in flipping this script. Last week, I challenged you to track your resources for 60 days. This week, I'm challenging you to flip the script for 90 days. For the next 90 days, handle your resources in the priority that Jesus taught. You give first, you save second, you live on the rest. Ideally, here's what this would look like. You give 10%, you save 10%. You live on 80%. That's called margin. And some of you don't know what it is. And if that seems like way out of touch for you, way out of reach for you, uh, the challenge that I'm issuing, we're calling the generosity challenge. And so if that's too much, um, choose a different percentage. Maybe it's not 10%. Choose 5%. Give 5%. Save 5%. Live on the rest of it until you can start building more and more margin in your life. Um, Here's here's the one thing that I would tell you. Whatever percentage you choose, it has to be a percentage that you notice. Like you fritter away 1%, 2% of your income all of the time, and you don't even hardly notice it. That's why last week's exercise was so powerful. You track it and you figure out where you're wasting money. So it has to be a percentage that when, when it comes time to release that, it causes you to like pause for just a moment and consider, can I do this? Should I do this? And then you do this. Um, And if you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't have to give to believers. In fact, none of you have to give to believers. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, don't give to believers. Give to a cause that breaks your heart. Give a percentage and, and and give it to something that that matters to you. But if you follow Jesus and you call believers home, I would encourage you to give right here. Because when you give here, you're giving to the Her Shelter, you're giving to Oasis Social Ministry, you're giving to Free Kind, who's a ministry that exists to to end human trafficking right here in Hampton Roads. You're giving to feeding centers in Nicaragua and orphanages in the Philippines, and so on and so on and so on. And I want to invite you to not just say, I will take this step. I want to invite you to actually sign up for the Generosity Challenge. And so we have a QR code. Um, It's in your notes. We're going to put it up here on the screens. Uh, This QR code you can scan with your phone. And um, what's going to happen? I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen if you register for the, the generosity challenge. You will get, for the next 90 days, one email a week. At the end of the 90 days, they will stop. Okay? So you're not signing up for something that you're going to get, you know, blasted for the rest of your life 90 days and then it's over and once a week you'll get a bible verse a word of encouragement um and some guidance because at the heart of this it's really not financial um it's really about choosing to make jesus number one in every single area of your life including your financial life Uh, This habit of tithing, of percentage giving, it's a keystone habit. And a keystone habit, if you don't know what it is, it's a habit that just has a cascading effect in every other area of your life. So first, you'll notice 
the change in your finances, they will be impacted, but then ultimately everything in your life changes. And your, your faith in Jesus will grow deeper and stronger because once you tie your faith to Jesus in something that is tangible, and for many of you, it'll be the first time that you've ever done that, it'll be easier to trust him in every other area of your life. Money is a test. Will you choose to put him first or will it be you and your appetites? And that's really the choice that you have to make. And remember, for those of you who follow Jesus, until Jesus is number one in your finances, Jesus really isn't number one. I think we can just stop playing that game. You aren't a follower of Jesus if you don't do what Jesus says. You're really more of a consumer of Jesus. And I know that stings just a little. But followers of Jesus actually follow Jesus. If your money could talk, it would remind you. I'm a better servant than I am a master. And if you were to listen to Jesus, he would tell you. No one can serve two masters. Not even you. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and just kind of begrudgingly despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some next steps that you might take as a result of being here today, the very first one is following Jesus for the very first time. Jesus wants you. That's what he wants. That's what he came and laid his life down for you because he put you first. And if you've never made the decision to follow him, I'll give you an opportunity to pray with me in just a moment. Secondly, memorizing Matthew 6, 24, remind yourself of the choice that you have to make. And you have to make it every single day. Who or what will be your master? Number three, taking the generosity challenge. Um, there's a link in your notes in the app. If you want to follow that link, that's as good as the QR code. Um, but go there and sign up for that. We want to be able to come alongside of you in this challenge. Last one, signing up for the financial learning experience. Um, it's free, sort of. The church has invested a fair amount of resources to put this event on. So we're making it available to you and to our community for free because we believe that it will help you. You can register for that today. Let's close our time with a word of prayer together. Father God, we love you. We're very grateful for your love for us. And you didn't just say you loved us, you demonstrated it. You laid your life down for us. You paid a price that we would never be able to pay, the price for our sins. And we thank you for that. And Father, if there is anyone here who is outside of faith in you, I pray that they would see, that they would hear that paramount to everything that Jesus taught on resources was this idea that resources compete with our heart. And they're competing against you. And you desire our whole hearts. Maybe you're here and you've never surrendered yourself to Jesus. Maybe you're here and you thought you had, but truth is, you haven't surrendered much of yourself to Jesus. You really aren't following him. And maybe for you, you need to surrender today. And if that's you, I invite you to pray with me and, and let me know that in the communication card saying that I'm trusting in Jesus for the first time today. And, and if that's you, you just pray and say, Father, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus who came and lived and died and rose again to pay for my sins so that I wouldn't have to. And I commit myself in this moment, not just to believing in you, that's easy, but to following you. And then, Father, I pray for my church family. I pray that we would choose our master well, that we would follow you with everything we have, that our faith would not just be a matter of our heart, 
but it would be a matter of fact. And so, Father, enlarge our faith. Grow our understanding of who you are. I pray for those who need to take a step and surrender their resources to you, choosing to make you their master, their Lord, their boss. Father, there are many in the room today who say they follow you, who have never yet surrendered the resources to you. And I pray in this moment that you would nudge them through your Holy Spirit to accept the generosity challenge. And Father, I'm thankful that I can urge someone to take this step, a step that's in keeping with who you are, and a step that I know that when they take it, you will show up big. And so in advance, we thank you for what you will accomplish in the heart and life of every person who accepts this challenge. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am very much looking forward to going through this generosity challenge with each and every one of you um, and just hearing the stories start to pour in about how you are seeing the power of God in your lives because we are really giving our resources to Jesus and allowing him to be Lord over our finances. Um, I have just a few announcements for us as we prepare to head out today. So we have another great way to uh, be on the give, and that is by participating in our blood drive happening tomorrow, uh, September 19th. So it's going to be from 1 to 7 p.m. If you guys are available to make a life-saving blood donation, you can head over to uh, the events tab of the website and get signed up for that. And we still have a little space for some volunteers. So if you guys are also able to come out and spend some time just helping to love on the donors and uh, get them signed in and all that, we would love for you to uh, check out the events tab and sign up for that opportunity as well. Um, we're also going to be having a opportunity to invite folks from our community and for each and every one of you to participate in something very exciting. We are having Believer's Theater, you guys. Are you ready to be a part of the theater? Yes, I know. I'm pretty, um, pretty looking forward to that. I will be directing. I don't know if you know, I have a theater background, so I cannot wait for us to get this back on, um, back on the ground. We are going to be doing a Christmas show, and uh, this is open to anyone in our community, so you guys can participate in the auditions that are gonna be happening for our Christmas production um, on October 3rd. It'll be right after the second service, and there are so many ways to get involved from helping with props, to being a part of the crew, to being a performer on stage, and so I hope that you guys will all uh, just pray about being a part of this experience and letting folks know that there is a really cool opportunity for them to get involved and connected in a different way in the arts this fall. So finally, as we are heading out, remember that if you call Believers Home, you have the opportunity to really be generous, just like we are learning how to do that together um, in our Money Talk series. And you can do that by uh, giving on our Believers Church app or website. And if you are in person today, you also have the option of leaving your uh, gift in the box on your way out. And I just want to remind you guys that us being able to do uh, events like we do and open up to the community and have all these experiences where they can come and learn these great great principles about their finances, about their life, how they can connect with groups. All that happens because of the way that you generously give here at Believers. And thank you so much for saying yes to that. All right, everybody, it is time for us to stand, greet someone around you, go get connected with each other, grab some invites in on your way out, and let's go and be loved.